Thank you everyone for joining. We will start our webinar in just one minute. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Jerry Green from the Pacific Council on, Inter on International Policy in Los Angeles. I am delighted to welcome you to our event today, which is a conversation on the quad. Um, let me introduce our, our speakers, and then I'm going to turn it over to them so we can get to the business at hand. Let me begin by introducing Ambassador Jane Duke. She is the Consul General of Australia in, in Los Angeles and has had a very um, distinguished career, which I will not go through because all, all of our panelists have, are remarkably accomplished and I really want to leave the time to, to, so that you can hear from them. Um, I then want to introduce uh, Akira Muto, who was the Consul General of Japan here in Los Angeles, and we are delighted to, to have Consul General Muto with us. Um, next, uh, Laura Stone, who's the, uh, the Deputy, um, sorry, Deputy Assistant Secretary of uh, State for South Asia. She's coming to us from the US Department of State in Washington. And um, I, I wanna thank uh, Ambassador Stone uh, for joining us um, because the State Department really for the Pacific Council is the gift that keeps on giving. So you're, you're always helpful to us and we appreciate it. Finally, I wanna introduce uh, Ambassador Nina Hachigian who's the Deputy Mayor for International Affairs uh, for the city of, of uh, uh, Los Angeles, and this speaks well to Los Angeles that someone with Nina's background would be appointed by the mayor simply to oversee the large array of international affairs um, which he is dealing with. Uh, Ambassador Hachigian is also a member of the Board of the Pacific Council. She will be our moderator. She will be fielding questions. And before I turn it over to Ambassador Hachigian, I just want to mention that the government of India, which India is a member, a key member of the Quad, uh, was also invited to participate today. They, uh, the Indian Embassy and Consulate are so bound up dealing with, with COVID issues in India, which has just been you know, uh, a tragedy beyond description that they simply didn't have the bandwidth to join us. So I didn't want anybody to think their absence signified anything other than, than the fact that they are so bound up in other issues. Uh, Ambassador Hitchigan, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Um, and I wanna thank all of our guests for for joining us. So thank you so much. And especially, of course, to our, our audience. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. It's always good to be with the Pacific Council. And I'm really excited for this uh, conversation because I think the Quad, uh, in my humble opinion, is the most significant structural change in the Indo-Pacific uh, in Indo-Pacific geopolitics that, you know, in my recent memory, in any case. And we have excellent official representation from three of the four countries involved. So let's just uh, get to it. Uh, because the Quad is not yet a household name, uh, even to foreign policy specialists, uh, I've asked the three panelists to give us no more than a five minute introduction so that we get some of the basics uh, uh, out of the way and we're grounded uh, all in the same uh, conversation. So let's do this in alphabetical order by country. And so I'll ask first my friend, Ambassador Duke from Australia uh, to begin. Thanks very much, Nina and Jerry. It's a real pleasure to be a part of this event. The Quad is a key pillar of Australia's Indo-Pacific agenda, which complements mm -hmm. our broader bilateral, regional and multilateral engagement. But for Australia, telling the story of the Quad begins with exploring why the Indo-Pacific is so important and what it means to us. Australia first referred to the region in these terms in our 2013 Defence White Paper and then again in our 2017 foreign policy white paper. The Indo-Pacific is Australia's neighbourhood. Our geography places us looking to the Indian Ocean on our west coast and the Pacific Ocean on our eastern shores. It includes all of Australia's primary trading partners in North Asia, our Southeast Asian and Pacific neighbours, as well as Australia's primary security partner and larger pr pr provider of foreign direct investment, the United States. The Indo-Pacific is the engine of global economic growth, including half the world's population, the world's most dynamic economies and its busiest shipping lanes. 
Put simply, Australia's future is tied to the stability, security and prosperity of the Indo-Pacific. As economies within the region have grown at varying rates, regional power balances have changed and the Indo-Pacific is at the centre of rising strategic competition. This has increased pressure on compliance with international norms and has seen increased tensions over territorial disputes. Simultaneously, cyber attacks and disinformation campaigns have been used to weaken and manipulate open societies. More recently, the pandemic has placed enormous pressures on many countries in the region. Australia's vision is for an open, inclusive and resilient Indo-Pacific. We are working to support an effective health response to the pandemic and a sustainable pathway to economic recovery. We want to support a stable and secure a uh, durable strategic balance when sovereign states can pursue their interests free from coercion. We want to enhance respect for rules and norms underpinning security and prosperity, including peaceful resolution of disputes in accordance with international law, freedom of navigation and overflight, trade and investment based on market principles, inclusive economic integration and openness to engagement, including the continuing vital role of the United States. Australia's success in realising this vision depends on the strengths of our partnerships. And in recent times, we've elevated bilateral, regional and multilateral relationships and entered into new trade agreements, such as the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. ASEAN remains at the centre of our vision for the region, and we share the principles outlined in ASEAN's outlook in, on the Indo-Pacific. Australia and ASEAN recently agreed to upgrade our leaders' meetings to annual summits, marking a new chapter in our strategic partnership. Quad partners champion ASEAN centrality and unity. The Quad helps us be better, more coordinated partners for ASEAN. The Quad had humanitarian origins in response to the 2004 Boxing Day tsunami, with Australia, India, Japan and the United States cooperating to coordinate relief. It's grown in recent years with regular meetings of foreign ministers, senior officials and experts, and its agenda has expanded to encompass the most pressing issues facing the region, from maritime security to counterterrorism. The significance that the historic Quad Summit in March was the first multilateral engagement by President Biden would not be lost on those tuning into this discussion today. When leaders met in March, they recommitted to quadrilateral cooperation with a renewed purpose, given the devastation brought by COVID, the threat of climate change and broader regional security challenges. In particular, leaders agreed to strengthen and assist countries in the Indo-Pacific access safe and effective vaccines, recommit to ambitious climate change action and strengthen supply chains. We welcome international interest in the Quad. What's important to emphasise is that the Quad agenda is a practical and positive one and complements our other regional engagement. The democratic character of membership is fundamental to its importance. It enables trust and the pursuit of distinct but aligned agendas anchored in openness and international law. It's also too important to be clear about the Quad is what the Quad is not. It is not and does not seek to be an Asian NATO. It is not a formal alliance or institution. There are no plans to broaden its membership. The Quad is not about limiting any country's legitimate access to the region. The Indo-Pacific is where we live. We are neighbours that share common goals. We have a long-term interest in its peace, stability and prosperity. Australia welcomes the increasing global attention paid to the Indo-Pacific and sees the strategies being developed by others, including ASEAN and Europe, Republic of Korea, New Zealand and others is entirely appropriate given the region's significance. We might describe how we refer to the region differently and take slightly different approaches to engaging each other, but we share the same objectives. So with that, I'll hand back to you, Nina. Thank you very much, uh, Jane. And let's pass it over now to Ambassador Muto for his five minutes. Thank you, Nina. Yes, uh, I would like to, uh, well, I have uh, some slides to share with uh, the audience today. Uh, uh, the Pacific Council can uh, you know, share the uh, slides uh, if, if uh, I would like today, uh, you know, uh, share the uh, state of affairs in the in the Pacific as we see it as uh, uh, we are challenged by the revisionist powers whose purpose 
is to uh, displace the United States from the region and reorder the region in their, in their favor. So next please. So the uh, free and open Pacific advocated by Japanese government is an attempt to address these challenges uh, by upholding the rules-based order. Next please. Uh, this region is important because 50% uh, of world trade runs through this region, especially for Japan where 83% of oil and 34% of natural gas imported by Japan is transported through this region. Next please. Three pillars of the uh, free and open in the Pacific advocated by Japanese government is as follows. First, the promotion of uh, values, the rule laws, including the freedom of navigation under the uh, Anglos Convention, uh, United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, and the free, and free trade and investment under TPP. The second pillar is the uh, upholding the balance of power by increasing the uh, military strength uh, presence of the uh, coalition partners. And the third pillar is the promotion of prosperity by building high standard infrastructure in the region in terms of economic efficiency, transparency, and debt sustainability. Next, please. Now, the uh, tactics and strategies of the religious powers is to divide and rule by uh, driving wages among partners and allies of the United States in the region. And the target as a weak links in the region, first and foremost, the Southeastern Asia countries, but all, even the South Korea is the target. And the next target would be Taiwan and Central Islands. Next, please. Now, uh, in Philippines, uh, President Duterte is leaning heavily towards China, away from the United States. President Duterte plans to end the uh, 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 visiting forces agreement with the United States from 1998 which is a foundation for facilitating uh, United States forces visit to Philippines to provide training for the Philippine forces. So ending this agreement would uh, complicate the uh, military plan for the uh, US to defend the Philippines. Next, please. Now in Cambodia, uh, China is building uh, dual use infrastructure under the Belt and Road initiatives. They have built new runaways, new uh, resort islands, which we believe would also serve for the uh, military purposes. And most of all, uh, China, Cambodia allows Chinese troops within their territory and they provide exclusive access to their military base in Riam, which boosts Chinese capabilities in both the Indian Ocean as well as in South China Sea. Next, please. Now, even the South Korea, when South Korean government allowed uh, U.S. Uh, third missile defense system to be deployed within the uh, territory of the private company Lotte. China penalized Lotte by shutting down the business in China. And ever since South Korean government have tried to accommodate Chinese concerns by embracing three no's, no additional uh, third missile defense system and no participation in U.S. Defense, missile defense system and no military alliance among United States, Japan and South Korea. Next please. And China has uh, entirely dismissed the international ruling of uh, arbitration award on South China Sea by arbitral tribunal constituted under the Anklos from July 2016 and continues to demilitarize the disputed features in the region and continues to claim historic rights over the natural resources within 200 mile zones of other coastal states, despite the ruling that they have no such rights and they continue to change the status quo in the East China Sea. The next, please. Uh, the next target, the Taiwan, uh, we are very concerned that the, uh, China is flexing muscle around Taiwan by engaging multiple, uh, uh, multiple military exercises, including the circumnavigation flight around Taiwan, engaging in the transit by their aircraft carrier through the uh, Taiwan Straits. Next, please. We are also uh, uh, concerned that the, uh, China is applying the uh, hybrid tactics on the Senkak Islands by relying upon the maritime militias, which are irregular forces or fishermen in camouflage. They sent 300 to 500 fishing boats in joint operation with the uh, Chinese Coast Guard ships in the summer of 2016, which was a serious attempt to change the status quo by coercion, if not by use of forces. 
Next, please. So the uh, democracies would need to uh, stand tight together under the free and open in the Pacific. And in this, the court can play a central role. And the United States would need to uh, join the uh, rules in the region and increase their presence by attending such a premier uh, summit like uh, East Asia Summit, in which uh, the former President Trump never attended. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Muto. Over to you, Ambassador Stone. Hi. Um, well, thank you for having me today and for uh, inviting me to talk about this important uh, new mechanism that's developing the quad. Um, I think as my colleagues have already noted, um, uh, the quad has done quite a lot and it is aimed at important strategic issues. Um, that said, it's, uh, it's important to know that while it fits into a, a very important strategic environment, um, it's, it's got a very positive agenda. It really is aimed at solving problems for the region and showing the value of these like-minded partners. Uh, it's in incredibly important uh, as we deal, look at this world that is um, devastated by COVID, that we have the, these mechanisms, these partnerships like the Quad, uh, particularly as we look at India and the devastation that has been wrought. Uh, it's uh, really valuable to know that we have the, this, you know, this sort of convenient organization um, uh, mechanism that uh, we can look to, to focusing on these, world, these pressing world issues. It's um, been really valuable in our initial days of the, the Biden administration that um, they really have embraced the quad. Uh, you know, as, as my colleague from Australia pointed out, the quad has, has a long history, but it's really accelerated recently. And it's accelerated because uh, it's so valuable that we are able to pool our interest and pool our resources. We, um, we are four partners that fit very nicely together. Um, you know, we have, uh, we have a similar mindset about you know the, our values in the world, but uh, but most importantly, we all come to the problems with a slightly different set of resources and capabilities, and that's been the great thing. So I've been involved in the Quad now um, for the past three or four years, and it's really been. Um, gratifying to watch it develop and to watch how each country brings together a very different set of, um, of skills and set of um, uh, resources that it can devote. Uh, and so we're definitely moving into all these areas that we can, um, we can really show value added. There are a lot of synergies uh, in the areas that we're cooperating in. Um, you know, obviously there's this whole idea of a free and open Indo-Pacific, which is our, our like-minded strength. Um, and you know, it's building on these these long-term partnerships while creating new partnerships. Uh, especially, you know, the various legs all exist in some some way, um, but they're all getting strengthened both bilaterally and I guess you'd say minilaterally. Uh, it's not really multilateral because it's four, but it's it's a strong minilateral concept. Uh, and um, you know, parts of these are people to people ties. We have science and technology. We have diplomatic uh, initiatives under the Quad. Um, now we're looking at moving into these, these new areas of um, direct vaccine COVID cooperation um, to, to save lives, uh, the um, cooperation on climate, uh, which is a, a um, area that I think is ripe for, for incredible cooperation um, and uh, working on emerging, emerging and new technologies, which is a space that uh, we really can all learn from each other uh, and then move it out beyond that sort of quad. So it's a great format where you've got just a few countries that are looking specifically at these big problems, but then we can broaden it out beyond that. The idea, while, while there's no intention to expand the quad itself, it's not an organization, it's a mechanism. It's a, it's a you know, informal meeting, um, but it's it's insanely valuable that we can then take what we've done there and move it out into, you know, additional space with with new partners uh, within that. Um, and so President Biden uh, hosted that uh, historic Quad Leaders Summit on May 12th um, with a spirit of the Quad joint statement. Uh, which broadcast for the world what the Quad is striving for. So uh, this is support for rule of law, peaceful resolution disputes, uh, democratic values to advance security and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific and beyond. And they launched these new initiatives. Uh, 
Um, there are, I would say, three kind of core elements of the quad. Um, the one is uh, diversity. Um, a diversity of focus where the quad covers a full range of political, economic, and security issues that are central to our shared vision. Uh, we work on whatever we can find that is, is valuable, uh, that we find that, that this particular grouping has, uh, has value added. Uh, another air, uh, the core theme is our adaptability. Um, we see the quad flex all the time because it's not rigid, because it doesn't have, you know, this huge secretariat and things like that. It has the ability to bend, to respond very quickly, as we saw with the summit, as we saw with the, you know, the, the renewed interest in climate, as we saw with the, the COVID response. Uh, this and its whole of government approaches on on all of our sides. And then um, the last theme is this delivery of values. Uh, the quad plays a vital role. Uh, in each member's vision for the Indo-Pacific region. And I think that that's sort of the, the value there. Um, we, we can really deliver on that. We can all look at this um, strategic convergence that we have among the partners uh, and the network of relationships that are building up um, and through institutionally delivering on our shared uh, values on things like the law of the sea, um, the free and open um, exchange of ideas, uh, health security, um, rules-based international order. So these are all just very, very valuable um, points that, that the Quad brings. So that, that whole idea of uh, diversity, focus, adaptability, and delivering on our values. So um, I'd like to thank my fellow panelists. Um, and I think that we really can agree that the quad is just starting. Um, you know, it's been around in various forms for a while, but we're really starting to find, um, find its place. Uh, and so we expect to see uh, from the next quad uh, and the next series of quad meetings or regular engagement at all levels from the working level all the way up to the presidential level and a push to make progress on the commitments that we've made in the recent summit so that we can have positive contributions to an Indo-Pacific of peace and prosperity. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you all for, for giving us a lot of information in a short amount of time. Um, Let's dive in now to a few more questions um, that I'll be asking you and then we'll have a chance um, uh, to take some from the audience as well. Um, you've all said in different ways, uh, these, you know, these different areas that the quad will be involved in, vaccines, climate, disinformation, uh, critical technology, maritime domain awareness. Uh, and I was hoping that each of you could talk about one of these areas in a little more detail on what you might like to see. So I thought we'd start with you this time, um, Ambassador Cooper, and maybe you could talk about um, climate and vaccines, two issues I know that are very important to the United States right now. Um, sure. So the climate and vaccines, this is a really exciting new area. It's really complicated. Um, and as we look to expand vaccine production, um, you know, sometimes in the U.S. we don't have the same um, sense at the moment of just how, what huge demand there is for, for vaccines, for expanding production. Um, I'm going to get the number a little wrong, so don't quite quote me on this, but I think we're trying to go from something like three or four million vaccines produced in the world every year to 12, uh, around 12 million. So the actual expansion is, isn't is just about, you know, we're going to churn out more vaccines. You have to churn out all the, the things that go into the vaccines. Um, you have to make sure the financing exists, the manufacturing capacity exists, um, you know, everything. We're, we're dealing with a global shortage of rubber stoppers. Um, that you need for, you know, these sterile, specific little sterile um, equipment that you need to make vaccines. So um, the Quad Vaccine Partnership was announced at the May 12th Leadership Summit, our leader, back Quad Leader Summit. Uh, we had the first meeting of the vaccine experts group with senior experts from all of our countries on April 19th. Um, the quad manufacturing work is an ongoing process and we're, we're really looking at it from a science-based and a technical expert-based uh, approach so that we can figure out how best to maximize the global approach to this vaccine, both the vaccine production and the vaccine distribution. From day one, the, the administration has recognized um, that uh, it really does need to to um, 
help the system along and make sure that we're, we're being as efficient as we can. Uh, we're also recognizing that there's a new initiative on climate um, as well in the quad. And this is, uh, I think, a reflection of the, the administration's focus on, um, uh, on reintegrating climate issues into our um, all of our engagements. Uh, and so there, there's a whole initiative under that as well that, that maybe somebody would want to speak to. Perfect. Um, uh, Ambassador Muto, you uh, gave us a lot of examples of um, various uh, maritime uh, issues. And I wonder if you want to talk about the Quad's role in maritime domain awareness among the Quad and then among other partners as well, potentially. You have to unmute yourself. There you go. Despite, as I mentioned, uh, despite our efforts uh, to uh, correct the behaviors of the religious powers in the region, we haven't been able to uh, succeed in doing this so today, to date. So we would need more pushback efforts uh, for, for those purposes. We would need to create a broad network of MDA maritime domain awareness uh, by expanding the scope of uh, information uh, gathering and exchange beyond the white shipping data to include the uh, military intelligence. Also, uh, although the United States and Japan and Australia have been engaged in the uh, capacity building efforts for the coastal states, this is a huge area to cover all the potential disturbances to the uh, maritime sea lanes of communications in a, time, in a timely fashion. So uh, uh, in the future, we would need to, uh, in, involved other uh, European nations uh, to, uh, to, to, to provide the uh, capacity building uh, support uh, in a full-fledged manner to the coastal states. Terrific. Um, Ambassador Duke, you mentioned uh, disinformation as one of the areas, and I was intrigued by that, and also technology. I wonder if you wanna talk a little bit more about the Quad's role in those areas. Sure, Nina. Well, disinformation isn't new. Uh, and uh, we know that some countries and their proxies have been using it for political, strategic, and economic reasons for some time. But this past year that we've all endured COVID, it's become a lot more prevalent and more dangerous with disinformation actually targeting COVID-19 vaccines. And so um, under the landmark Quad Vaccine Partnership that Laura referred to, uh, Quad leaders agreed in March to uh, cooperate to respond to some of that vaccine misinformation. Uh, and that builds on an earlier commitment by Quad foreign ministers to deepen Quad cooperation on disinformation more generally. And um, moving on to the second area, the critical technology, it was a third outcome of the Quad um, Summit of March to establish a critical and emerging technologies uh, working group. And that group has been mobilised and top level Quad officials and experts have been um, uh, uh, meeting and uh, uh, priorities are to uh, develop a statement of principles on technology standards. Uh, and that will be in consultation with um, standards um, bodies from the various um, uh, countries in the region and a broad range of partners. And it's also going to address a broader range of cooperation about technology, future developments about, te uh, about telecommunications, equipment suppliers, uh, and more broadly address supply chain issues. So it's an exciting new development of uh, quad um, activity, but really essential for the um, global economy as well. Great, thank you. Um, so it, I'm interested in the fact that we've, you know, we, we've discussed these number of different goals uh, that, that the that the quad is going to, to try to tackle or, or problems, I should say, and, and opportunities. Um, and it's explicitly among democracies um, and aimed at, the, at a free and open Indo-Pacific. It's not a, um, a secret that, that all the quad countries have had various disagreements with, with China that would seem to relate to this common vision. And I'm just wondering if that's a, a fair characterization, not so much that the quad is aimed at all at China, but that they're 
that the idea of a free and open Indo-Pacific, that some of some Chinese behavior might, um, you know, fly in the face of that. So let's start with you, um, Ambassador Muto. Don't forget to unmute yourself. Uh, uh, for the region, I think, you know, uh, upholding the rules is critical when a particular country is not is totally dismissing the rules. And when you talk about the rules in the region, uh, the uh, UNCLOS, the United Nations the Convention of Law of the Sea, is a universal law of the sea and is a legal basis for the freedom of navigation. Okay, terrific. Um, why don't we go uh, to you then, um, Ambassador Duke. Thanks, Nina. Um, Australia is also being concerned about the stability of the South China Sea uh, as a crucial international waterway and the norms and laws that govern it. So just as um, Consul General Muto has outlined in his introductory remarks and also just now, um, we've been concerned about the militarization of disputed features. We're concerned about the behavior of um, Coast Guard, dangerous use of Coast Guard vessels, which are destabilizing and also efforts to disrupt other countries' legitimate resource exploitation activities. So that's an ongoing area of concern um, about the potential for escalation of already existing tensions. Um, but we, we really want a constructive relationship with China. Uh, we want to discuss our differences. We want to work together for mutual benefit. Uh, and China is going to remain really essential to Australia's economic future. Um, I just draw attention, our foreign minister, uh, Maurice Payne, was in Washington, D.C. recently uh, having uh, a meeting with Secretary Blinken, and she, she made the point that we're not going to compromise on our national security or our sovereignty, and we'll continue to act to protect that. But in that context, I'll just flag that Australia remains concerned by a series of um, disruptive and restrictive trade measures introduced by China on a wide range of Australian goods and services. And of course, we're talking to China uh, bilaterally, but we're also raising it at the WTO, uh, requesting the establishment of a WTO dispute uh, settlement panel on China's introduction of uh, some anti-dumping duties on Australian barley, which uh, amount to some 80%. Um, so we stand ready to uh, engage China in a dialogue to resolve these issues. They've said that they're committed to open trade and the multilateral trading system. We want to resolve these issues in accordance with the internationally agreed rules, uh, and we hope to do so um, uh, in, uh, in the WTO. Wonderful, thank you. Ambassador Stone, over to you. Thanks. I'm really glad you asked this question um, because it's it's very important. So China has a tendency to trot around the region claiming that the Quad is an anti-China alliance and that, uh, you know, it's aimed at surrounding China and that, you know, we're going to militarize the region through the Quad and things like that. And that's just absurd. Um, you know, the Quad is, is uh, it is as I said, uh, founded on strategic convergence. It's stranded, found, founded on an idea that these countries really do promote rule of law, but it's a very positive agenda. And to the extent that uh, China feels threatened by uh, democracy, that China feels threatened by rule of law, and that China feels threatened by a group of countries that are trying to work together to solve COVID, I mean, that's more China's problem than ours. Uh, you know, quite frankly, this is a very positive agenda. It's aimed at solving problems. It works on humanitarian assistance, disaster relief. It works on um, providing security, you know, um, unbiased security in the region. It works on um, infrastructure that is aimed at uh, having, you, you know, using international standards in which the, the countries and the communities are driving the, the agenda and driving the infrastructure. Um, so, it's, it's really is one of these areas of misinformation that somehow the quad is aimed at undermining China. China's undermined by its own values. It's not undermined by the quad. Terrific. Um, so this is a, uh, you know, a common initiative, of course, but you all represent very complex countries with lots of different interests. And I wondered if you could each give an example 
of something you would like another country in the quad to do to make the quad stronger and it, or its common vision uh, stronger. Um, all, all in the spirit of, you know, partnership, of course. Uh, but let me start with uh, Ambassador Duke on that question. Thanks, Nina. Um, I might focus on multilateral trade, actually. Um, the signing of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership that I referred to in my uh, introductory remarks, uh, that was signed in um, November last year. Uh, and it's actually between ASEAN, its free trade partners, China, Republic of Korea, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand. And it's hugely significant uh, because those 15 member countries account for more than 30% of global GDP and 30% of the world's population at 2.2 billion. Uh, so that makes it the biggest trade group in history. And what's significant about it uh, is that it establishes regional and common rules of uh, e-commerce on trade and on intellectual property. Uh, it's got unified rules of origin, which is going to help facilitate supply chains and reduce export costs throughout the block. And what we'd really welcome is the US considering pathways for a renewed and enhanced engagement in the Indo-Pacific and have a seat at that standard setting and rulemaking table. Um, and so whether that's a return to the Trans-Pacific Partnership or whether it's another pathway, having the US engaged in these uh, new developments in economic architecture and rules for the Indo-Pacific is something that we and many other partners would love to see. Um, we'd also love to see um, getting the WTO appellate body back and working again. Um, for many smaller economies, it's the best chance of having economic coercive practices addressed in accordance with the internationally agreed norms and we're working with the US to, to achieve that. Terrific, thank you. Ambassador Stone, same question to you, what, what you might ask other Quad partners to do. Well, in the context of the Quad, we would love to see the Quad partners continue the, the summits. Um, you know, we, we do feel like it's incredibly valuable to have uh, that leader vision that goes along with the, the um, quad. Um, obviously, we have a bilateral engagement um, and agenda with all of our partners. Uh, there's room for improvement uh, on uh, and we find it very valuable when our quad partners come to us with suggestions for working groups. So, for example, on things like the standard setting. Um, we have under the, the new emerging technologies uh, working group that was established at the presidential summit. Uh, one of the big uh, pillars, I think they call it under that, is a, um, an effort to establish common norms and common standards. Uh, and I think that is going to be a very important part of the, the arrangement. So those, those kinds of things, because we are big economies and because we are economies that um, can look at standards. I do think that that's, uh, that's one of the most valuable things that came out of the presidential um, summit. Great, uh, and Ambassador Muto. You're already unmuted, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. <laughs> yes, uh, no, thanks Nina for the question. Uh, I will be frank, you know. Uh, to be to to make sure that this uh, institution work, works better in the future. So I'll, I'll come back again to the rules, which is the uh, UNCLOS. Uh, now, uh, vast majority of the uh, international community, 167 countries are the member countries of the UNCLOS. You know, the, law, the UN Law of the Sea, for those of you who may not. Convention of the Law of the Sea. Uh, well, the United States, although is an architect of this agreement, has not ratified the agreement to this date. Now, when a particular country, uh, I'll be frank, in China is dismissing the, uh, uh, the international ruling under the UNCLOS, uh, you know, US uh, government's uh, you know, uh, argument to abide by the ruling is powerless against the uh, Chinese counter argument that the uh, United States is even not the part of this agreement. So uh, we very much hope that the Biden administration would argue for the ratification of the UNCLOS. 
Thank you. Okay. I, I have to say that is, uh, well, I, I know that the US response to that, which is, of course, that we, we abide by the law of the sea uh, as, as um, in our practice uh, to the letter, um, even though that we haven't ratified it. Um, but, I, but I have also heard the, you know, the, uh, the Chinese counter arguments. So uh, terrific. Um, I'm actually interested in, in the reaction that other countries in the region have had, particularly in my old post uh, at ASEAN. Um, and uh, you know, uh, Ambassador Duke touched on this, but ASEAN prides itself on being the center of geopolitics in the region, and it hosts a number of important uh, meetings, of course, and uh, where where you know ASEAN and its partners try to find consensus on policy issues. But I'm wondering um, how you think about the relationship of the Quad to to ASEAN or South Korea or or New Zealand, and I can start with you, uh, Das Cooper. And don't forget to unmute. For it worked when I hit the, the space bar. Um, the yeah, ASEAN centrality is central to this this vision that we have. We understand that you know ASEAN strength is uh, um, essential to maintaining the the vision that we do have as like minded partners in the Quad. Um, and so you do see the United States both uh, um, unilaterally, multilaterally, and bilaterally reinforcing that uh, that desire for partnership with the uh, with ASEAN and the desire for ASEAN um, unity, uh, centrality, and strength. Um, you know, you saw last week when President Biden highlighted. Uh, with uh, how the United States and, and the Republic of Korea are going to work together to uh, address regional and global issues of concern with partners. They incl he included ASEAN, or they included ASEAN and the Quad. Um, so uh, there's not really this question of Quad expansion since Quad is a meeting and a mechanism and not a, an organization. Um, but you know, we do look for any kind of opportunities as, as a group to, um, to, to cooperate with the partners in ASEAN, both the ASEAN as an organization, but uh, the individual members as well. So we see that very much as um, something that's not in conflict. Uh, and it's also the kind of thing that we do encounter a lot of misinformation about, about this attempt to say that the Quad is an attempt to dominate small countries or things like that. It couldn't be further from the truth. Terrific. Uh, Ambassador Muto, do you wanna add anything to that? You're st still muted. There we go. Uh, I'd like to uh, add to that, you know, uh, the, uh, the role that the uh, South Korea can play. Uh, it seems to us that the uh, South Korean has, uh, you know, kept certain distance uh, from the uh, free and open Indo-Pacific Indo efforts. Uh, we uh, presume that the uh, uh, South Korean government is uh, unwilling to uh, openly uh, challenge China because openly outraging China would have uh, consequences on the uh, North Korean policy, which is a top priority for the current uh, uh, Korean government. But uh, Korean you know, um, involvement in, in our joint efforts uh, for the free and open Pacific would send a very robust message uh, through China in the region. And Ambassador Duke, do you want to add? Thanks very much, Nina. Um, I mentioned in my remarks about how important ASEAN was to our vision for the Indo-Pacific being, and we, we use slightly different terminologies. We, we talk about a um, an open, resilient uh, uh, region um, and inclusive. and. Um, uh, with ASEAN, it, it's very much at the very heart of um, being able to achieve that objective. We were uh, ASEAN's oldest dialogue partner. We um, entered into formal diplomatic relations in 1974. And over the last number of years, we've really doubled down on our ASEAN engagement and enhanced uh, relations with it, having um, entered into a strategic partnership, 
uh, upgrading our regular leaders meetings to annual summits and increasing our uh, areas of cooperation um, from everything from, um, you know, human trafficking through to economic cooperation. And so it's really important to uh, us to keep working with ASEAN centred architecture like the East Asia Summit of which we're all members and we work very closely as you remember Nina in that and we see the quad as uh, a complement just like Laura said uh, to our multilateral engagement that we have within the region to our ASEAN engagement and um, we've got all kinds of um, sort of configurations um, like um, India Indonesia, Australia in a trilateral group uh, that works together in the region together and again in, um, in um, support of ASEAN objectives. We have a, obviously a very close relationship with New Zealand. Uh, we have a free trade agreement together with New Zealand and ASEAN and we work together on economic cooperation on uh, developing standards in competition law and policy and establishing areas there. So um, just like um, we said before, the Quad very much supports ASEAN centrality. That's a message that we've all been very consistent in giving to the ASEANs. Well, it's music to my ears, of course. Uh, <laughs> so um, I'm gonna now turn to audience questions. We have a bunch of uh, terrific questions here. Um, let's start with uh, this one. Uh, what is the Quad's biggest challenge? Um, and any of you can, can jump in to start. Or I will volunteer uh, Ambassador Muto to start. Uh, what challenge? Uh, let me see. Uh, is a... Uh, Well, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't have any idea on that. Okay. Any, either, either Ambassador Duke? Uh, it's probably right now, uh, um, the health and um, economic recovery of the region post COVID or, you know, we're still in the thick of it um, and many countries in the region are devastated. And that's one of the reasons why it was so important that leaders in their summit in March talked about um, the, the, the landmark vaccine um, partnership uh, to get that going and, and helping countries in the region uh, and having a sustainable pathway back to economic recovery is gonna be really important for stability. Ambassador Stone? I should have two answers. Uh, one is the tyranny of distance, time zones. Oh, geez. We can never find a time to have a meeting, uh, especially now that we're in the virtual world. But then even when we have to travel, it's just, it's it's really hard. And anyone who does international business knows that, that just finding a way to get, you know, Japan, Australia, the United States, and India in the same place at the same time it really sucks. Um, but the, um, the other... I mean, sort of more seriously, the, the challenge is also the strength. Uh, we are really quite, you know, even though we sort of have a, a basic like-mindedness, we're really different countries. Um, some of us are bigger, some of us are smaller, some of us are, you know, um, have geographic, different ge geographic uh, demands on us, uh, different uh, stages of development. So it's, you know, you have to find places that we converge, but at the same time, it's also, we've discovered sort of fairly recently that coming at it from such different perspectives, actually, as long as you work with it, ends up being an incredible strength also. That's, uh, that actually goes right to this next question, um, which is how do you align different areas of concern with four different, very different quad members? So maybe uh, you and you can start and then others can chime in of like, how do you actually do that work of, of aligning interests? Uh, you know, that's a, it's a, the, the, we spend a lot of time before we do these working groups, when we set them up, we spend an awful lot of time um, uh, kind of exchanging paper back and forth and working at the working level to find out where the overlap is and where we can actually work together. Um, you know, we don't try to be everything. Uh, we are not the United Nations. We're not trying to do everything. We're trying to do the things that we're good at. And so we spend an awful lot of time saying, okay, in this space, in humanitarian assistance, where is where do we actually align? And so that's basically what it is. We don't try to be everything. 
Um, you know, if we don't have an exact alignment or we can't do something productive in that space, we just don't do it. Um, and we focus on the areas we can be productive. Terrific. Anyone want to add to that? Okay. Um, this is an interesting one. Uh, as continued conversations pick up steam, are there early indications of support for a trade deal between members of the Quad? It depends on what you talk about as a trade deal. Um, the we um, we haven't talked about you know a traditional trade and goods kind of deal, but um, to the extent that we're talking about the areas of the world or the areas of international commerce right now, in which we um, are, are absolutely essential to facilitating trade that is very much the topic of discussions. We talked a lot about the, the emerging technology and standards, and uh, we talked about infrastructure. We have uh, working groups that talk about infrastructure investment, that talk about financing. Um, so while it's not the traditional idea at the moment of some kind of um, you know TPP comprehensive trade deal, uh, there's all the pieces of it are, or a lot of the pieces of it are under discussion. Oh, and by the way, somebody asked why is uh, it SC, uh, the South Asia and not East Asia? It's just because we actually are South Asia and East Asia. We, we do it together. Um, and uh, it, it, I just happen to be here today, but the, uh, my East Asia colleague is also an equal partner. That was a question um, about where in the State Department. Right. Um, so another, does anyone want to add to that, uh, to, to the question about trade deal? Uh, yes, uh, uh, I would like to uh, I would like to support the uh, what the Ambassador Duke said earlier. Uh, you know, we don't need to create a new trade trade uh, agreement from the scratch, uh, since we already have this uh, TPP. Uh, and TPP is, uh, as Ambassador Duke mentioned, covers around uh, 30 to 40 percent of world GDP if the United States joins. And it's considered as a very high standard uh, uh, agreement, uh, uh, opposed to the uh, the RCEP, which does not include such a provisional. Uh, I mean, such a pro progressive provisions as a, uh, digital commerce and transi transition to the local uh, transition to the low carbon economy, which the uh, TPP has. So the uh, withdrawal, the United States joining TPP. Uh, would have benefited the United States in various ways. Uh, and the US withdrawal from the TPP has been a really uh, serious setback for the rules-based order in the region. Uh, uh, and it actually pushed uh, the countries like South, South Asian countries, as well as the uh, South Korea, to join the uh, China-centered RCEP. Uh, uh, so uh, I think, you know, uh, despite all the uh, domestic uh, difficulties uh, for the uh, Biden administration, I think uh, joining, rejoining the TPP would be offer the best, best option for the United States. Thank you. All right, uh, we've got about five minutes left. I, there are two more uh, questions here. Uh, let me just ask both of them and then ask you to um, answer uh, any part of any of them you want. So one is um, in terms of critical technology, is there, uh, is there a vision to uh, include meetings with the private sector? Um, uh, second is, well, actually there's three. That, uh, is there an opportunity for the Quad to resurrect the Clean Network Initiative? Not sure what that is, so maybe you do. Um, the, um, the next is if there's any signs uh, that China may want to construct a counter quad uh, of its own. Um, and I think that just about does it. Um, so uh, why don't I give it to Ambassador Duke first uh, to answer any of that that you might like. 
in about two minutes. And what you can chat. <laughs> All good questions. <laughs> uh, I, yes, I understand there are plans to engage the private sector with the critical, critical technologies group. Um, that, that group's moved quite fast in quite a short space of time. Um, and um, as I've mentioned, the high-level high experts are, are talking together from the various countries. So I'm sure uh, the private sectors um, are, um, in their minds. In terms, uh, I, I don't know what the Clean Network Initiative uh, is in particular, but um, climate change is another of the working groups that was agreed at the, um, the March summit. Um, so perhaps um, Laura might be able to add to that. Uh, and in terms of um, the last question, um, I, I think China is um, concerned uh, about the Quad uh, and has its um, many um, uh, strong relationships with countries in the region um, and, uh, and particularly with ASEAN, just like the rest of us do. I'll leave it to others to give their thoughts on some of those questions. Great, and uh, Ambassador Muto, you're next for about two minutes. Yes, uh, I'll just briefly mention about the uh, problems uh, for of the uh, electric electric battery uh, in terms of the uh, clean uh, technology. Uh, uh, because electric battery relies on the rare earths such as lithium and the uh, cobalt. Now, uh, uh, the problem of these rare earths is that they are disproportionately uh, located in China. So which uh, easily brings about the uh, problem of the uh, supply chains. So under the free and open in the Pacific, uh, we would need to uh, collaborate to ensure that the, uh, the uh, free trade uh, ensured uh, for the trade us as well. And that's one of the reasons I uh, advocate for uh, uh, the other uh, clean technologies such as the hydrogen. Uh, Got it. Uh, and Ambassador Stone, we'll give you the last word. Got a couple minutes. Great. Um, you know, I guess I think the one thing that kind of combines all those things together. Uh, so the clean network has to do with: uh, Do you know uh, who owns all the technology? Um, all the way through a, a network. So do you, it, it's not um, environment, it's, it's about um, like 5G technology. And do you know who owns your servers, who owns your switches, who owns your, you know, wires and things like that all the way th through to the handsets. Um, uh, and, you know, they, these questions about expanding the quad, the questions about who's going to be a member, the question about, you know, are companies going to be involved, are, um, is it going to move into space that has to deal with batteries and electricity and and everything else that all gets down to this basic idea of there's a lot of enthusiasm for the quad right now and how did we pick these members and you know one of the great things about it is it, it, it's very organic the stuff we've ended up doing and where it's going to go is going to be based on this idea of flexibility the idea that it's nimble um and that um you know, it's it's not rigid. It's not uh, you know, uh, 170 countries that are all have to come to a consensus. It's uh, um, you know, it's sort of setting a model. And so, yeah, we can deal with all that stuff. Yeah, uh, yes, uh, you know, I think that there'll be a lot of interest in, you know, where do technologies go and who owns what technologies. I think there'll be a lot of interest in, um, uh, um, uh, you know. Uh, working with new partners and, you know, not always being super rigid about it has to, a quad has to be for, it can be quad plus, it can be quad plus plus, it can be quad with other, you know, it's an open architecture, it's an open um, uh, concept and, you know, is China trying to form a quad? You know, imitation is the highest form of flattery uh, and it's because it works, it's because this is a really, you know, good model, a dynamic model, it's not an exclusionary model, um, it's, you uh, um, it flows into where the the demand is in the the system and for you know for these uh, for governments, uh, and so I I sort of want to leave it on that note. It's it, you know it's really working quite well um, right now. It's uh, at a nascent stage, but it's also already showing its value. Um, so I think that that's why you're getting all these questions of is it going to do this? Is it going to do that? How are they going to counter it and things like that? It's because it's really successful and it's really working out uh, at a very early stage uh, as one of our, our stronger models for uh, international engagement at the moment, not to the exclusion of anything else, but just as something that works. 
Wonderful. Uh, thank you all so much for a super fascinating and informative uh, session uh, on behalf of all the Pacific Council members and Los Angeles more broadly. Uh, thank you and, uh, and, uh, and good luck.